So my name is Kimberly Lawless. I am a second year professor of social work here at Bethany. And uh, Dr. Lane uh, contacted me to, uh, to do the introductions and moderate uh, the session with Dr. Heidi Schreiber-Pan. And it's my great honor to do so. Um, I'm gonna share a little something with you guys um, and uh, bear with me. Um, so one of the things that, uh, that uh, Dr. Lane may learn, um, anytime you ask me to do anything in public, I'm probably gonna read you a poem. Um, so in considering how to write this introduction, I thought first and foremost of our speaker, Dr. Heidi Schreiber-Pan, and asked myself, what might she like to hear? I decided poetry was in order as I often think it is. And I've cho chosen two short pieces. I don't doubt that Dr. Schreiber Pan has heard them before and I hope she doesn't find me too predictable when I share them here. They are relevant for her, the work she does. So here goes. I worried by Mary Oliver. I worried a lot. Will the garden grow? Will the rivers flow in the right direction? Will the earth turn as it was taught? And if not, how shall I correct it? Was I right? Was I wrong? Will I be forgiven? Can I do better? Will I ever be able to sing? Even the sparrows can do it. And I am, well, hopeless. Is my eyesight fading or am I just imagining it? Am I going to get rheumatism, lockjaw, dementia? Finally, I saw that worrying had come to nothing and gave it up and took my old body and went out into the morning and sang. There's one more I'd like to share with you, another short one called The Peace of Wild Things by Wendell Berry. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the sound and fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting for their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Dr. Heidi Schreiber-Pan is a therapist, author of Taming the Anxious Mind, a guidebook to relieve stress and anxiety, and a sought after speaker on topics such as resilience, anxiety, neuroscience, and occupational burnout. As an affiliate and former faculty member of Loyola University, Maryland, her past research has focused on resiliency and psychological well being, including nature based mental health. Dr. Schreiber Pan has worked with various organizations, schools, and corporations to reduce stress on a communal level and to increase structural well being through training in positive psychology as well as emotional intelligence coaching. That part was all from her website, which is wonderful. This part is not. Uh, Dr. Schreiber Pan uses storytelling, metaphor, and practical application of, of coping techniques to enlighten, encourage, and empower people who are seeking to improve their lives by reducing stress and anxiety and increasing mindfulness, self-compassion, and self-care. Please join me in wel welcoming Dr. Heidi Schreiber Pan, helper, teacher, and guide. Dr. Schreiber Pan, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Wow, what a wonderful introduction. I feel all warm now. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> very, very happy to be here. And thank you, thank you for the invitation. And everyone that is on this call, I'm so glad you're here to, to spend the next 45 minutes with me, uh, or about an hour with me to, to learn a little bit about mental health and what nature has to say about it. Uh, and um, I'm really excited to, to talk about this topic. I'm going to um, screen share so that we can start with um, kind of a, a little visual for you. So you are here for mental health in nature and I'm going to go to the next slide because the next slide is a little bit of a introduction about um, how I got to this topic. So I'm going to make you a little jealous here for a second because the picture you're looking at is actually the Italian side of the Dolomite Mountains. And that was, so to speak, my backyard growing up. Oh, wow. <laughs> I grew up 
I grew up on the border um, between nice. Austria and, 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 and Italy. And uh, so this was um, my home because my dad was a mountaineer. And so in the winter we would go skiing and in the summers we would hike those mountains. Mm -hmm. So then um, I ended up coming to the United States to study psychology. And it's so funny, right? When you have been removed from something, then all of a sudden you realize how much you actually are grateful for that place. So once I came to the US and the funny thing was I'm in Maryland here and they said to me, oh, wow, we have mountains. We have really big mountains. <laughs> and I was like, okay, great. Where are they? They're like, yeah, you have to go out to Western Maryland. And so when I saw the mountains, <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, that's nice. <laughs> but of course, <laughs> I'm fine. I was thinking about these big ones that are in Europe. So I started kind of longing to go back to, to, that, to that part of the world. And a few years happened and I planned this trip and it was an August trip. So we went back in the summer and I had picked out a really strenuous hike to the summit point of one of these mountains. So it was August, we're heading up there, I've got my pack on the back and we hit every possible weather you can imagine. We had a hailstorm, we had ice, we had snow, there was deep fog. And so we get to this hut that is the hut right before the summit where you're supposed to rest through the night. So in the morning you can summit and the innkeeper comes out and he says, bad news, you guys, it is um, a complete mess. The weather is not gonna be moving anytime soon. It's stuck here in these mountains. And I was so disappointed. I had worked out for a year to be in shape for the summit hike. Um, I had brought my, my husband over who had never seen this. And I was very, very disappointed. At the same time, I had a little bit of an existential crisis. I was asking myself if God actually really exists. And I was doing a little bit of spiritual like questioning. And so I remember going to bed that night and I just decided to, oh, what the heck? I'm just going to send up a prayer. And my prayer went something like this. God, uh, if you're out there, I will take a little miracle. And if you could move those clouds and fog so that I can have a wonderful view tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning, I will start believing in you again. <laughs> Something like that, okay? So the miracle did occur, you guys. I woke up the next morning and it was the most pristine morning. No clouds, no fog. We hiked up another hour to the summit. And ironically, the summit in Europe um, have a cross on the top to show you that you've reached the, the summit. And I remember standing up there and I had something that I later as a researcher looked into, which is called spiritual transcendence. And it is a moment when we lose our sense of self and we tap into something much bigger. You might also be familiar with this term if I would say the term awe, experiencing awe spiritual transcendence. So I had this moment, right? And I, I'm just completely taken out of my head, which is, by the way, a good place for us. We want to do this as much as possible. <laughs> and I'm just taken by everything. And this thing happens to me where I'm thinking, these mountains have been here way before me, and they will be here way after me. And I'm touching this moment, and I'm part of it all. And I don't care about my problems. And I want to be here forever. <laughs> you know, that moment, and then I had to come down from my mountaintop experience and I came down and I made a commitment to myself, which is to find a way to bring nature connectedness to people as a form of healing, specifically healing for mental health challenges. So I came down, I enrolled in a PhD program. And from the very start, my research started focusing on connectedness to nature and mental health. And so I arrive at this moment. And I get really interested in positive psychology. So positive psychology is kind of a newer field that is kind of moving away from this idea that there is the disease model, something's wrong, we need to treat people, right? Positive psychology says there is a lot right with people and that people that are doing really well they have a common denominator. And what could that be? Why are some people more resilient than others, right? 
So, and whatever they, those people have, I want it. <laughs> I, want, I want to have more of that because I want to be more resilient. So I looked into this field and lo and behold, there it is, nature connectedness. So it turns out that people that are much more resilient, that bounce back from adversity, that are overall more psychologically well, also are more connected to nature. All right, well, we need to go back in time, right? Let's go back all the way to 1901. So this is John Muir. And by the way, this is the top. This is one of the summits in Europe. They have these crosses on there, just so you see it. All right, so John Muir says, climb the mountains and get their good tidings. Nature's peace will flow into you as sunshine flows into trees. The winds will blow off their freshness, blow their freshness into you and cares will drop off like autumn leaves. Okay, I don't know about you guys, but I could use some of these cares that need to be dropping off right now, right? Just came out of this pandemic, there's a war in Europe, like, like we need some of these cares to drop off like autumn leaves. How do we do that? Why does nature have this ability to do that? Well, before we can really look into the reason of what does nature have to offer, we have to have a little bit of a better understanding of the human mind, okay? So I love to use stories to illustrate concepts. And so I have to tell you the story of the river crossing as an introduction to your mind, because I know your mind. You're in my office all the time. <laughs> so the river crossing is a story of a senior and a junior monk as they are on a journey. They have to cross the river, but overnight there was rain and so that there's a current now and it's harder to cross. They notice that there's a woman that's sort of looking stranded and is needing to get to the other side. And so she asks for help. Without much to do, the senior monk picks up the woman, puts her on the shoulder and helps her across, puts her down. She goes this way, the monks go this way. About two hours later, the junior monk reaches over and he says to the senior monk, I can't stand it anymore. I have to speak out. We have committed to vows that we can't talk or even touch women. And you actually carried a woman, you touched her across this river and, and put her down. And the senior monk looks at the junior monk and he says, yeah, but I put her down two hours ago, and yet you are still carrying her along with you. So the nature of the human mind, it likes to ruminate. It likes to worry. It likes to play the same stories over and over in our minds. And although in this example, and in a lot of these examples with the mind, the woman, that moment has long passed, and yet, it is this moment that the senior monk is still carrying around because we can't let it go. And how much freer we would be if we could let things go, right? So little introduction to the human monk. <clears throat> My glass of water, I have it right here. And I like to just illustrate this little experiment of if I kind of hold this glass of water, which is pretty full still, and I'm holding it um, up with my, my hand, my question would be, how long do you think I can hold this? Or is it too heavy for me to hold? And some of you might say, well, it's not too heavy. You're obviously holding it and you probably could hold this for a good amount of time. And the truth is I can hold it, but if I kept trying to hold it and an hour would go by, I can tell you that there would be an intense pain that would be running up my arm and that would be the only thing that I can focus on because that's how pain is. It needs your attention, right? Um, I would simply have to put the glass down, right? So what if this is an analogy for your stressors, right? You are actually well equipped to handle stressors. What we cannot do is hold the stressors for an extended period of time, because if you do, Chronic stress is going to turn into some pain in your body, migraines, back pain, um, acid reflux, hypertension, 
you name it, right? Body, mind body connection. And that will be the only thing you can concentrate. So we have forgotten as the human species how to put our stressors down. We've forgotten how to do this. So why have we forgotten how to do this? In order to figure that one out, we need to talk a little bit about um, our, our human brains that are really sensitive to stress. So our world in 2022 is a world of office towers and traffic lanes and emails that are constantly coming in, right? And despite living in this modern area and surroundings, our bodies are actually not adapted to that kind of living, right? And why is not adapted is because for 7 million years, um, our ancestors started evolving from a subset of pri primates so all that means is for 99% of your evolution, your body and brain was outside, connected to the natural world, connected to the seasons, the phases of the moon, what is in season, what, is to, what can you eat? You were connected to other species. But now we are indoors most of the time. We are constantly doing things that involve screens, right? We're really not connected so much to the um, natural environment anymore. And our brain and our body says, I don't know how to handle this. That is not how I grew up. <laughs> Someone said, it's kind of like you take one of your house plants that needs sunlight and water and you put them in the basement, right? Um, with no light and water. Like how long is that gonna, plant is gonna last? And I'm wondering what are the effects on the human body of us moving indoors and spending our modern day time uh, in such different way than we evolved. So the answer is we're stressed. We're super stressed, okay? So we have created this culture where we're looking for the human multitasking machine, right? Mm -hmm. People are asked to multitask. It's even a question in interviews now. How good are you at multitasking? <laughs> and I hear that and I'm like, oh boy, here's the deal. We don't have a multitasking brain. We have a single tasking machine. And when you're multitasking, a whole host of errors happens in your brain. It affects your hippocampus. You can't consolidate memories. It's a hot mess, just saying. <laughs> so just to give you a fun little example, you guys. All right, here's the deal. So I'm writing something, right? Let's say I'm writing my next book and a text message comes in. And all of a sudden my brain feels the need to check the text message. But here's what I want you to understand. All the neurons in your brain that were just activated to help you write your book or your essay, all of those have to be deactivated and a whole different set of neurons needs to be activated so that you can look at your text and response. And then those need to be deactivated and then you need to reactivate the neurons that help you write your essay. All of that takes you up to 15 minutes to get back to the speed that you were and when you were first concentrating on your essay. And you create, um, you making errors and things like that. Mm -hmm. So we really were never meant to live this modern day life for a whole host of reasons. But let's talk a little bit more about the inner workings of the mind. So how does the mind work? Well, the mind works a little bit through this filtering system. And I'm gonna give you an example of that. Imagine that you move to a new neighborhood and you hear that there is a, um, there, there's a little welcome gathering and there's a little happy hour with the neighbors. So you're like, this is great. I get to meet my new neighbors. So you walk in and there are people there and you notice how everyone's kind of talking to someone and they're like engaged. And then you are waiting for someone to come to you and start introducing you, which does not happen, okay? But then something happens, which is a thought. A thought happens. And the thought says, oh, maybe, maybe they don't really want to get to know me. Maybe this is kind of a close group. Maybe it's a little cliquish, you know? Maybe they're really good friends with the people that, um, that I bought the house from. 
So that happens, a thought. The next thing that happens is a feeling. A feeling happens uh, as a consequence of that thought. Well, if that's my thought, people don't really want to get to know me. I'm going to start feeling a little awkward and uncomfortable there. Okay. And then according to that feeling, there's then going to be a behavior. The behavior in this case is I get out of there. I'm like, you know what? I don't need this group, blah, blah, blah. I'm walking back to my house. Okay. Now you might say to me, that was silly. The person who was in charge of welcoming you got, you know, was in the kitchen and was getting snacks ready. If you would have waited five more minutes, it would have all been fine. But I chose to believe that first thought. And then I fell backward and then I left there, right? It's the stories of the mind that often create a reality that might not actually be the reality. And our mind works like that all the time with all the different things you do. Every experience you have is going to go through this filtering system first, right? Now, on top of that, um, you, you feel emotions, you have a lot of stressors, right? And then we know that when, the more stressed we are, the, our fuse gets shorter and shorter, which then also might cause diff, you know, negative thoughts to enter. So Compare that though, that kind of um, fast paced thinking and living and you know, short fuse and all that with um, what happens in nature. Okay, so I want you to look at the top left slide. At the top left slide, this is my family. We're out backpacking in Wyoming in the, snow, in the snowies. And for one week we're out there in nature. My question to you is, what do you think the brain has to do? What is the job of the brain, right? What is it looking for? It's taking in the landscape, it's scanning for any dangers, right? It does that all the time. Um, but what we realized in the field through di different studies is that an environment that has fewer choices um, has also less filtering in your brain, right? So we know that there is what we call soft fascination which is a really interesting um, kind of quality of the brain. It is interested and alert, but it's also relaxed at the same time. Compare that with the lower to the right slide. This is kind of a modern office day setting. There's a lot going on for your brain that your brain needs to do. It's multitasking, it's socializing, working on a project, it's hearing different sounds. There's a lot happening. And when we think about it, stress is often mental fatigue. It's when your brain says, I can't do this anymore. I mean, think about it. We're asking our brain to do higher executive functioning from the minute we wake up because we check our emails or whatever, read the news all the way until we go to bed. Now our brain evolved during a time when we were outdoor dwellers, when we were in tribal groups, we went to bed when the sun went down. Okay. So now with the advent of electricity, we don't ever have to stop. <laughs> we can keep going. There's always going to be light, right? It always sort of stimulation for the brain. And at some point that mental fatigue is going to catch up. Now, the way it catches up is different for all of us, but is that felt sensation of overwhelm, of worrying, of not being able to power down, right? We start breathing in short and shallow ways because the brain is thinking there's a threat around you all the time. So really looking at this idea of our constant daily treadmill of tasks is wearing out our frontal lobe. And brain resting, this is when the brain goes, ah. <laughs> brain resting is associated with soft fascination. Remember that one? That's when the brain's interested, but also relaxed. And we see this brain resting happening when we're exposed to natural environments. Okay, let's take a look at this part here. Um, one little interesting, you might find this very interesting. So 90% of our brain evolved during hunting and gathering. So this was a really important time during our human evolution. 90% of the human brain evolved during hunting and gathering, which just means that 90% of the brain that you have today, our ancestors had during hunting and gathering. So what mattered the most during hunting and gathering? Well, hopefully you're thinking immediately survival, but mattered was 
am I going to survive, right? Do, am I safe? Do I have food? Do I have shelter? Do I have my group, right? And what we developed during this time of survival focus is what we call the negativity bias. The negativity bias is the way I'd like to describe it to you is the it's like a searchlight that the mind has. So you've seen these searchlights that move through the landscape and then land on things, something they're look, it's looking for, right? And this is a searchlight that is looking for what's wrong with your life. It's looking for things that aren't good enough in your life, how you don't have enough friends or enough money or enough status or how you get ticked off by your roommate or whatever it is. But it's always, always, always looking for what's wrong. We all have it. We all have it. We all have the negativity bias. That's why we, you know, the news sells because we have to focus on what's wrong and how to keep ourselves safe, right? Um, some people have it more than others, but we all have it. And since we all have it, we have to find a way to intentionally reduce the negativity bias. Okay? And the negativity bias, one of its antidotes is the gratitude practice. So this is when that searchlight, when you're intentionally moving that searchlight away from what's wrong, and on to what's right, what's right. And there's always, always, always something to be grateful for in your life, no matter what your situation. What research shows is that people tend to, tend to find it easier to find things they're grateful for when they have a stronger connection to nature, okay? So it might be as you're starting to, um, go through, you know, looking out more and you're seeing the seasons are changing, you're seeing that spring is coming, maybe you're grateful for the warm, the flowers are coming up, getting on a good hike and you, you're grateful for that. So tend to be a correlation between gratitude and nature connectedness. And gratitude is our antidote for the negativity bias. What we also know is that when we are in nature, um, it tends to renew our attention. Remember how we talked about the sort of mental fatigue and it's this overuse of our prefrontal cortex? Um, we early on, the scholars of the, of the time, even in 1989, found that, um, that it really helps with renewed attention. And after like mental exertion, that we tend to go back down to baseline uh, quicker if we have a nature exposure. So you might find this really funny how, you know, back then the ethics codes weren't as, as strict as they are today. So they had a, um, a, a um, research study where they had people um, do something that would activate their sympathetic nervous system. So they were like in fight or flight. They gave them a math problem that was not solvable. And then they had someone in the lab code say, this is an easy problem. I can't believe you don't know how to do it. So people were getting stressed out. They're like, oh, I don't know how to do that. Oh my gosh. And so they were getting like activated, right? They were feeling stressed out and they measured that. And then they had people either look at a slides of nature or they had people look at sort of neutral slides, like maybe of a cafe or um, fruit or maybe, you know, uh, like a, an urban district or something. And they found that the people that looked at landscapes of water, of the beach, nature scenes significantly quicker were able to, um, to go back to baseline and renew their attention. They felt better, uh, activated the parasympathetic nervous system. So the three-day effect, David Strayer, University of Utah, he discovered that, yeah, 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 that's all true. What Kaplan did back then in eight, 1989 with the math thing, but what he found is it gets magnified. That effect I'm talking about got magnified after three days in nature. After three days, on the third day, there was a significant change in the brain where people scored much better on creativity tests, problem solving. Um, the EEG showed less energy coming from sort of the stress center of the brain. So there was what he describes a cleaning of the mental windshield on day three. 
So that's when we're looking at the immersive nature experiences, right? Now, daily doses of nature are important, but we also know that when we can have an immersive experience, it can be more profound in terms of the effects. So what we know is our bodies tend to relax in pleasant and natural environments. And we have to find a way to integrate that into our daily life. So nature works by, in many ways, but one of the studies shows that um, it lowers the stress by 16% your cortisol drops, 2% in blood pressure and 4% in your heart rate. And this is within 20 minutes of walking in a forest setting. So that's pretty quick. That's a pretty quick effect. So again, the question is always, why do we have so much anxiety and stress? Um, and there is a direct correlation of when the Homo sapiens started and during the Industrial Revolution, only 200 years ago, um, we started, you know, transitioning to an indoor life. Um, and it's sort of correlating at that time where we, we just see more mental health issues. And as we are spending more time inside on screens, we see just more mental health challenges. Now this was, um, these are stats before even the pandemic. Um, we saw that children spend about 30 minutes per day on structured outdoor play, um, whereas the average American child spends about six hours per day on screens. Now past pandemic, um, there, it's probably much higher than that. Um, but we can't just look at the kids, even adults spend less than 5% of their day outdoors, right? And then we have 40 million adults suffering from anxiety and 16 million from depression. Coincidence? I don't believe so. Um, I believe that um, the disconnect from the natural world is a direct consequence on our mental health challenges that we have. So I'm also a therapist, so I started doing my own little observations. I would ask my clients, and I specialize in anxiety disorders, so some of my questions um, I like to ask about, you know, what helps you deal with your anxiety? What help, what's a coping mechanism you use? And what gives you meaning? When do you feel most alive? Um, asking people if they've ever had like a spiritual moment or a moment of awe. Um, integrating people's spirituality, if that is um, something they would like to do. When do you feel closest to God? What helps improve your mood? Um, what helps you put things in perspective? And the answer was always nature. Nature, nature helps me. One of my very favorite studies that I did for my, that I read uh, when I prepared my lit review. I love this study so much. It was a study that um, collected this group of people and um, they put them in two groups. And what they were supposed to do is they were supposed to spend a few hours reflecting on a loose end in their life. So something that was kind of an issue in their life, they hadn't found really help for yet. And the one group boarded a bus and they went to a nature conservancy. And they spent their two hours wandering around there and doing some reflecting and things like that. The other group uh, boarded a bus and they were brought down to more of an, like an urban district. And they were just walking around the, the streets and maybe a cafe and things like that. The hypothesis was that the nature group would return having found the solution to their problem, right? That was the hypothesis, which is not what happened. What happened was, is that the nature group came back and they said, I could care less about that problem now. <laughs> so talking about putting things into perspective, we go out there and all of a sudden the intensity of these problems, they seem to not feel so intense anymore. And I just love that. So this idea of putting things into perspective. Nature informed psychotherapy, right? Is where psychology and ecology meet. So that's really where we're taking um, our understanding of what the natural world can do for us and integrating it to mental health. Um, what's really interesting is when you're outdoors, your brain tends to be more alert, right? Because when you're inside your house, you're, you're pretty safe and there's not a lot of movement. There's the same temperature. And so your mind is kind of, like easily could daydream or in this kind of, you know, in this in sort of automatic thinking mode. But when you're outside, there's always movement. Either there's a breeze or there are insects flying around or there's a bird above. And that movement triggers the brain to be alert, to stay present, right? There's also different smells and different colors and things like that. So it's actually much easier for the mind to stay present when we're outdoors. 
So we want to use that. We want to use that to help us to stay in the present moment. Well, you might ask me, why is that so important to stay in the present moment? The reason is, is that mental health flourishes in the present moment. Anxiety is connected with future thinking. Remember that thinking? Worst case scenario is going to happen. And when it happens, I can't handle it. The what ifs, right? That's all future stuff. And then depression's a little bit more on the depression side, right? Ruminating on past events and how we didn't do something right or whatever. None of those two places exist. I was in grief and loss for a while. And I tell you, there's no guarantee for tomorrow. No one plans to die, but we all have to die. We do not know about the future. We do not know if there's a guarantee for the future. What we do know is I have now. And when people can anchor in the present moment, that's where mental health tends to flourish. The now, how I feel now, right? That soft fascination about the mind in nature. Shinrin Yoku, forest bathing. You might've heard of it, forest therapy, forest bathing, but it's really that physiological effect on the body when we're in forest settings, right? There's all kinds of stuff happening inside your body that is a good thing for you <laughs> when you're in the environment that is made up of trees and natural plants. We'll get there in a second too. And then spiritually speaking, most people that have had a spiritual transcendent moment, a moment of awe, nine out of 10 people, when you ask them to describe that, it includes the natural world, okay? And it doesn't always have to be something like the Grand Canyon, right? Um, it can be with the eyes of wander, we can see all, all around us. I mean, you guys are in West Virginia. It's one of the most beautiful states there is. It is absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. So um, you can skip through that. Distress tolerance. Oh my gosh, I love this one, you guys. This is one of my favorite concepts that comes out of the mental health nature field. So distress tolerance is this idea that since we have moved indoors and we artificially control our temperature and we're rarely hungry, we're rarely cold, um, we have created an addiction to comfort. And that addiction to comfort has translated into inability to cope with internal discomfort. Mm -hmm. And so what we like to do is find ways that nature can help us lean into discomfort. We call it safe suffering um, because it can help us become more resilient on the inside. So what that means is when the weather is less than perfect, <laughs> we still ask our clients to consider having an outdoor session and see if we can't lean in to the rain or the cold, even if it's just for a little bit. Um, nature is great at providing this distress because there are ticks and the weather sucks sometimes and all that, right? So you can count on nature to be like, let me help you out with the distress tolerance. <laughs> Try camping or backpacking. That's one of my favorite ways to lean into the stress tolerance. But it's really that we have become very soft, right? I like to think of it as, so I have this beautiful little dog. Um, she's a, a beautiful dog, a Carolina dog. And, but she's the domesticated version of the wild wolf. And we, you and me, we're the domesticated version of our wild hunting and gatherer ancestors. And that domestication process has created softness. We're soft, but can't handle things. We need to move towards allowing safe suffering. It's okay to not be comfortable all the time. It's okay. And when you can lean into that, all of a sudden, you can also bring a little bit more acceptance to some of these difficult emotions. It's okay not to be happy all the time. Depression has its role to play, right? Or sadness, right? Mm -hmm. So distress tolerance is a beautiful concept that nature can be very helpful for us to lean, lean in and learn these things. Connection. Um, I love this one that says, there is no Wi-Fi in the forest, but I promise you'll find a better connection. One of the kind of newer issues on the mental health field is this issue of loneliness. 
loneliness, our understanding of loneliness now is that it has as much of a negative impact on longevity as smoking and being obese, right? So it has a very negative impact on how long you're gonna live. Uh, humans are not made for living alone or being isolated, okay? We come from a tribal community. We, our power is in connection and community. The whole like rugged individualism, I don't need anyone, that does not line up with our understanding of human evolution. To be honest with you, alone as one person, we would have never made it, never made it. We only made it this far as a species because of collaboration, community, tribal, I look out for you while you, you know, do this. That's the only reason we've made it this far. So to think that we're somehow going to make it all by ourselves is not going to work. So one of the things that comes out of this disconnect from the natural world is also what we call species loneliness. And species loneliness refers to, this is the first time in human history that we spent most of our time with only within our own species, right? We're around our own species all the time. And our ancestors were interconnected. They, they were always in touch with other species. If it was understanding the insects or um, through hunting and gathering the plants, knowing the plants. They say that a middle schooler today can identify many different computer programming languages, but can not identify a single tree in their backyard. And that is species loneliness. We don't know anymore what the tree's name is, what's the purpose. I walk in the forest, I have no idea about the beings in the forest. And that is species loneliness. So one of our offerings to the mental health field is, I wonder if we have something to say about loneliness, if we can create, we can go back to interconnectedness. And our understanding, my next slide, of trees now is that trees um, are so much more than meets the eye. They nurture each other, they communicate, they support mutual growth, they share nutrients, they, they're a community, they communicate, which means that this is a part of a system we're part of, right? So connecting with other species this here study of awe we talked about that here's my the funnest part so remember i'm going to go right back to where i started this earlier i'm on top of this mountain i see the dolomite mountains i'm like oh my gosh this is amazing but then i realized that i can't just go keep going to the alps to find awe so i'm starting to look for things that i find awe in so i'm grading papers i was teaching into the psych and i'm like all you know busy with grading papers i'm sitting on my deck and I have a flower on my deck and I notice how a honeybee lands on the flower. So I decide to pause my little grading thing and pay attention. And I have to tell you, it was, it was really a moment of awe. I don't know if you've ever seen that dance that a honeybee does on a flower to collect the, the pollen. It is, it's a whole thing. <laughs> It, it's a beautiful thing. And so I experience awe. And then I look at UC Berkeley and they're doing amazing work on the science of awe. And they say, hey, when you experience awe, we actually see areas in the brain light up at, in accordance with your moment of awe. You become more socially, you know, you, you have more pro-social behavior. Mm -hmm. You feel more spiritually connected. People with awe are more generous. They have lower stress. And I'm thinking, do we not need more pro-social behavior in this world right now? I feel like we should say amen, but that's a different, different place. <laughs> okay, so I know I'm running out of time. I have to make sure that I talk about all the important things. Um, so awe and forest therapy, um, Japan had a, a, a crisis, a mental health crisis about 10 years ago and with really high suicide and depression rates. And so they were trying to figure out how do we help our people? And they really sort of started this whole like forest therapy research. 
And what they are now doing, which is absolutely fascinating, if you, um, let's say, work it for a company and you do your whatever eight hours before you go home, they actually take you to a um, therapeutic forest environment where you do a 30 minute stroll through the forest. Um, they measure your body and then you get to go home. And so what they find is um, it de greatly decreases the heart rate of the participants. They have less um, cortisol. The parasympathetic, which is your rest and relaxation response, gets activated. Um, we see a little less significant results for kind of type A personality. They still get there. It takes a little longer. <laughs> but um, that's kind of how they're working that in now for their people. And it's absolutely fabulous. Really great research coming out. So one of the other things they discovered is um, phytocytes, which are airborne chemicals that plants give off to protect against pesticides, insects, and things like that. These are natural chemicals. Now, the trees use that to protect themselves, but Homo sapien breathes it in, and it actually has an incredible effect on our immune system. Um, it has all these antibacterial and antifungal qualities. Um, so by breathing in these, um, we also see activation um, in our um, sort of natural killer cells that help fight cancer. It is fabulous to be able to know just by walking in the forest and taking a deep breath in that you're actually doing something that could be prescribed through medicine, right? So the question is, is it time for doctors to prescribe nature therapy? And in order to answer that, I want to show you a little clip that's trying to answer this. So hopefully technology is on our side and it will work. So let's, let's give it a try. Do you find yourself longing for the apocalypse? I did. I was looking for a reason to live. Hi, are you feeling tired, irritable, stressed out? Well, you might consider nature. From the people that brought you getting outside comes prescription strength nature, a non-harmful medication shown to relieve the crippling symptoms of modern life. Nature's recommended for humans of all ages, and it's great for pets too. Nature can reduce cynicism, meaninglessness, anal retentiveness, and murderous rage. In clinical studies, nature is proven to decrease work-induced catatonia. Caution. Nature may cause you to slow down, quit your job, or seriously consider what the f you're doing with your life. If you are overly cynical, jaded, or emotionally numb, you may need to increase your dose of nature. Do you have trouble being even mildly uncomfortable? Nature may not be right for you. Side effects may include spontaneous euphoria, taking yourself less seriously, and being in a good mood for no apparent reason. So ask your doctor if nature is right for you. All right. <laughs> Do you love that one? This is the perfect ending. <laughs> okay. I'm going to close us out and then move to questions. Um, and this is a shout out to Kimberly, because you know me well, because you started us with this poem and I end us with this poem oh. <laughs> from Wendell Berry, yeah. um, the piece of wild things. So you get to hear it one more time. How awesome. When despair grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and I lie down where the wood drake rests and his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought or grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting for their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and I am free. All right. Way to take it out with Wendell Berry. <laughs> Thanks for doing that so perfectly. Okay, so before we head to the chat, um, what's next for you? Maybe next is reading the book, maybe 
a nature immersion. We do backpacking trips, actually in West Virginia. <laughs> so right near you guys. Um, Peace in the Wild weekend retreat that would be on the Chesapeake Bay for people that rather not carry their whole pack on their backs. Um, or just learning about a three month training that trains people on nature and mental health. Um, I, my contact is here and um, I'm looking forward to hearing some questions, thoughts, comments. I'm gonna stop the screen share. Where do you do the, uh, the backpacking in West Virginia? So I believe it's the George Washington Forest. And um, I forget, it's like my, my team is doing it this year. Um, yeah, about two, three hours drive from Baltimore. So, but it's in West Virginia. <laughs> Great. Well, I'll start out with a question. Um, so, um, all right, I'm, I'll, 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 uh, uh, do a little uh, self-revealing here. So I, wor I worked for a number of years out in the field and, and, and social work. And, you know, as, as a, a therapist yourself, you may know what it's like to work for a, a private nonprofit. And um, you may be familiar with some of, uh, of the challenges of, of that work. And um, so there was a lot of talk about productivity and making sure that you uh, met all of your, uh, met your productivity and, and met with your clients and did all the things and all the paperwork and all of that. And so, and one of the things that became very uh, challenging for me um, is that I found that I began to feel guilty about, uh, about my own lack of self-care. And every time someone would talk to me about, well, you just need to do some more self-care. And I would become like sort of resentful because I began to think of self-care as something that was yet another obligation that I was not meeting. I was failing at self-care. And um, so what I've, you know, I've, I've since been able to kind of reconcile and uh, that part of my, uh, that part of my history and things like that. But, um, and I've moved on and, and kind of developed my own coping mechanisms and, and, and dealt with that. But my question has to do with how do you see employers and the role of licensing agencies and employers in terms of, you know, how can they support the work of self-care, because we know all the evidence, all the research shows how important this work is and that that is part of, of, being, um, of being an effective employee. How can, um, how can employers yeah. better support their employees in their efforts to achieve yeah. self-care rather than just simply preaching it at them? Right. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting because I'm often invited to do like executive leadership retreats or corporate wellness. And what I always like to say to them is that, you know, it's about profits and productivity. It's the truth. It's about profits and productivity, right? That's where the, the leadership is going to listen. And it turns out that productivity is not about hammering away the to-do list. That is not productivity. Productivity is putting yourself in the right frame of mind. And it turns out, and research backs this up, is that if you have a 30 minute lunch break, you absolutely need to go outside and walk a little bit. Or if you're stuck at a problem um, on your screen, if you walk outside and take, you know, do a few laps that you are, will put yourself into that frame of mind that's going to create better productivity. So if we can really help people understand that pro what productivity is, which then turns into profits, right, is um, it has nothing to do with hammering away a task, mm -hmm. but we have to put ourselves at the right frame of mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to get to a few of these questions. I was, was you... going to say there you have a, yeah. a few things in the chat. That's do you awesome. would you like me to read them or do you just want to go through them yourself? Yeah, I, I got them here. So I'm going to read them out. And then so one person was talking about the um, getting healthier dose of nature, given the effects of seasonal depression. 
So I, there is a really interesting thing happening at Harvard Health, which they um, are modeling a nature pyramid after the food pyramid. So the food pyramid is kind of what we're supposed to eat more of and how many things we're supposed to eat, right? But now they have a nature pyramid that talks about you need nature a little bit on a daily basis, weekly, monthly, and annually. Um, but what they're talking about is that um, I think it was five hours a month. Um, nature time is, is one of those that kind of create like a, a proactive stance to, uh, to have less depression. Um, but what that means is we need the natural light um, because it has to do with your serotonin, has to do with your vitamin D. Um, so as much as possible, finding a way that you can be outdoors, even if it's just 10 minutes, even if it's just 10 minutes. So taking these little bite-sized approaches to being outdoors, um, even in not so ideal weather, <laughs> there, there's still sunlight usually that, that comes on in. Um, but I think that if you are patient with yourself and you set up a routine um, and you do it for 30 days, what about like a 30 day challenge? And the 30 day challenge is that for 30 days, you go on a 10 minute walk every day and you look for things that inspire all. Take a picture of it with your phone or take a sketch. This is a study they just did at UC Berkeley and they found that when you give people that um, assignment to do that, people are actually going to have the same experience as the people that are staring at the Grand Canyon. So that awe experience in the brain. Someone's talking about the four agreements, which I love. That is a great book. Um, and so is there a way to learn how to think less negative, negative thoughts? Yes, there is. Just a plug for therapy, you guys. <laughs> a therapist will help you with that. Um, but that's, that's really that a waking up to what your mind is doing. So what I always like to tell all my people to do is the mind is like an untrained horse. And if you're riding an untrained horse, you barely hang on for the ride. And the idea is to take the reins back. You want the mind to be your servant um, and help you. But in order to do that, you got to get to know the mind, which meditation can be extremely helpful because you're sitting there and you're going, so what's my mind doing? I'm trying to breathe or do a body scan, but what's the mind doing? Well, it's thinking about this, this and that. Um, and so meditation um, can be really, really helpful. And then also calling the mind out. Ah, here's the mind thinking negatively again. Here's the mind making assumptions. Here's the mind catastrophizing. Here's the mind blowing things out of proportion. And as soon as you name it, you tame it. You name it to tame it. Okay. Some of the best practices or example on how to include a healthy dose of nature in everyday life. Yes. Um, so again, that food pyramid is really important. Uh, but I want to bring up this idea that the, the um, happiest countries in the world, we know how they, they assess that every year to see who are the happiest countries in the world. And if you're following that, um, you know that every single year it's the Scandinavians. It's the Finnish, the Swedish, the Norwegians, the Dutch, and they have the longest winters, <laughs> right? They're the longest winters. So um, someone started looking into that. Why are these people so happy? Well, one of the things is that um, they go outside most of the time, their schools have recess outside, no matter what the weather is, they just you know put on the clothes and they head outside for at least 20 minutes, right? And then during the winter months, they create this huga, which is there is a Dane, is a Dutch way of saying, um, I'm going to create a cozy nest. I'm gonna have candles and fire and I'm gonna make this coziness, but they always go outside to kind of earn the coziness, right? Um, so really important to find a way that you can stay motivated to be out um, every day, even if it's just for 10 minutes. I'm wondering if you can comment on a special situation of stress encountered by college students or young adults who are searching for a good future plan, career, while balancing the demands of everyday life. So difficult. Oh my gosh, our our college students are um, struggling right now. I, I hear that for sure. Um, I think that, remember that whole like, um, 
research about people going out for two hours and then they come back and they're like, ah, oh, it's not all that important, right? Um, and of course, careers and, and all that is important. But I think what makes it unmanageable is when we constantly nonstop think about it. Hmm. And we're under this illusion that if we just think hard enough about it, that we're going to find a solution. And that is not true. Because if that were true, you would have already found your solution, the 500 hours you already spent thinking about this. <laughs> so why not try something completely different and just move out of a, your environment, go into nature and to a place where you don't think about it, right? And then go back to it. But this constant thinking about it, I have to know the answer now, this has to be solved now, that is only going to create more pressure and more busyness in the mind, and you're not going to find a solution. I have a question, like, so this is related to that. It's related to, um, you know, a, a lot of what you, you talk about with regard to social media. How do you encourage young people to, you know, and not it's not really just young people anymore. Let me just be very clear about that. But I am thinking about students um, who really are clutching those phones all the time. And I'm wondering, how do you encourage young people to break from that constant, um, the, the, the constant media? Yeah. It's what do you so, do? so hard. Because, you know, the, the way social media is designed, it's like slot, machi slot machines in Vegas. I mean, it's specifically designed to, to create addiction to it, right? So it's very, very, very difficult to move away from it. We're in our mental health center are seeing more and more young people that are coming and asking for help, asking mm. for help, how to unplug. Um, and so one of the things is letting everyone on social media know that you're going to take um, a fast, a uh, social media fast for a week. So not to worry about you, but you're going to be offline for a week, um, like kind of letting people know that's also a, a way to hold yourself accountable. The other thing is when the phone is laying on your desk, your brain knows it's there. So it's always going to have, um, it's always going to focus on it. So really important to put it in a different room, um, in the drawer away so that there's no visual contact with it. I had a real estate agent who um, had such an addiction to her phone because she felt like she had to always be on she actually, her and I came up with this idea that she went home, she handed the phone to her 15 year old son and she said, you're going to hide it for two hours. If I ask for it, do not give it back to me. You cannot trust me on this. Take it and do not give it back. And so she enlisted the help of someone because she knew it was out of her control, right? So sometimes we have to do this. Um, I like to go camping. And so I usually pick places that have absolutely no cell reception <laughs> because I know that will force me to unplug. Okay, do we have time for one more question? I know we're going over time and I wanna- I think that we do. I don't, I don't think there's a problem. Time. Yeah, so the last question here is talking about, and this is really a great question. So thank you for bringing that up, which is there's a thin line, right? Between much, too much anxiety and anxiety that's helpful. So absolutely true. The reason we are successful as a species on this planet is partly due to our anxiety. Our anxiety has helped keep us safe. Here's my analogy for you. Everyone has a smoke detector in their house. The smoke detector is there to keep you safe. If there's a fire in the house, alert you so you can get out. The smoke detector that is dysfunctional will start going off when you're cooking your stir fry vegetables in your kitchen. It's not supposed to go off when you're cooking. It's only supposed to go off when there's a fire in your house. But that is a part of your brain called the amygdala. It is there to keep you safe in case there's a fire. <laughs> but some people have an anxiety issue or challenge where that smoke detector goes off when you're just cooking. And there's this hypervigilance where we're thinking that threats are constantly there when they're really not, right? And so, yes, my role as a therapist is absolutely never I'm gonna take away all your anxiety because your anxiety is there to keep you safe. What I wanna do is make it manageable so that it's not running your life, that the smoke detector doesn't go off at all times when it's, because it's blaring and loud and it's annoying, 
um, so that we are much more um, in charge of listening to the anxiety when it really is helping us, right? So um, I think that a toolkit, I always think of it as a toolkit, you know, if you have really strong anxiety, you have to have a toolkit to help that amygdala stay a little bit more calmer. Your breath, yoga, practice meditation, exercise, nature, time, all those things in your toolkit are going to help that smoke detector to not go off so frequently. Awesome, you guys. This has been absolutely so fun. And thank you, Kimberly, for being my moderator. <laughs> absolutely. And, and as my last job, I would like for anyone who feels comfortable doing so. So I have a tradition with my classes that at the, if, if we're on Zoom, which we aren't really on Zoom very much anymore, but if we're on Zoom, I ask at the beginning of class that they turn on their, their screens and say hello. And at the end of the uh, class that they turn on their screens and say hello. So if anyone feels comfortable turning on your screen, um, I think it would be a, a, a lovely thing to do to say goodbye to uh, Dr. Heidi uh, Schreiber Pan and say thank you. I would like to say thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who was on this call and interested and um, it was it was a, a fun talk, and you all are are doing good work. And keep in touch for sure. Be happy to stay in touch with anyone. Hi there, um, I'm Angie Beto. I'm the alumni association president for the college, and I am delighted that um, Bob lined this up for everyone. Thank you so much on behalf of all of us alumni, because we are. Um, that was so valuable. Very much appreciated. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Angie. I appreciate those sentiments. Absolutely.